Hi, my name is Regina Monaco. I'm a researcher at the Center for Dynamical System Studies. And today I'd like to say a little bit about artificial intelligence. What is it and why is it so cool? I don't have control of the slides, so I have to ask the host to go forward one, please. Okay. So uh, let's go back in time a little bit. It's an interesting question to ask why uh, AI is so cool or so interesting or so popular, but let's consider first uh, the history behind AI and, and human beings' um, longstanding interest in intelligence in uh, being put into inanimate objects under the control of humans. In fact, uh, it goes back to 400 BC and very early history. Humans ha seem to have always had a desire to understand uh, the origins of intelligence, cognition, and consciousness. And while AI doesn't really touch on consciousness, it doesn't answer anything about consciousness now, and it sort of touches a little bit on cognition, um, but it's really kind of focused on understanding or trying to understand what intelligence is now. But in 400 BC, people didn't have any tools to answer that question. And yet they still showed their interest by writing myths and having a whole, we have a whole human history that we all share that this goes back um, centuries. So for example, one of the first very well-known um, stories or myths was the Greek myth of Talos. And Talos was a bronze man or bull. It's a little unclear, it's a very old uh, story. And this man was made out of metal under the control of the king. And uh, in, the, in the myths, this, this Talos was a protective agent or a protective being. Um, however, it was clearly not human and his intelligence was, uh, was embodied into him by the action of a person. So it was, it was, uh, it was showing that people were interested in having inanimate beings also come forward and be intelligent. Um, there's more history of a golem and the golem is a Hebraic myth. It's an anthropomorphic being made of clay or earth or mud. And it's made to come to life again under the control of humans. Um, it can never have a soul and it can never become human, but it gets life uh, usually by the writing of a symbol or something on its forehead uh, or on its arm or in its mouth. And that can be taken away by removing the symbol. So even though this intelligence is embodied into this inanimate object, it's clearly and importantly always under control of the person who gave it that um, uh, that genesis. So this, this myth has persisted over many centuries, actually. So it has taken a lot of different tones over these centuries. Sometimes the golem is friendly in some myths. Sometimes he's hostile. Uh, sometimes he's very scary. Sometimes he's protective. Um, and this just runs the gamut of human beings' interest in intelligence in things that are not human again. And we want to control it and we want to understand it. Um, for historical purposes, here's a picture of a golem that I, I really liked. Uh, this is in the museum at Prague. I believe it's at least a thousand years old. It is made of clay. Uh, and you can see it's very finely made, but it also, to my mind, looks a lot like a robot, a modern robot. And this is well before people had anything to do with robots. It's a very angular design. And, uh, and it shows the characteristics of a golem that I just described, that it's human-like and that it's made of mud and it doesn't show, but the myth is, again, that it would come alive and it would, do, it would be under your control. In fact, in the 11th century, a golem was proposed to do uh, household tasks, which is very human indeed. <laughs> um, and of course, we're familiar with other myths, Frankenstein and Terminator and, and uh, Iron Giant and all kinds of data from Star Trek. There's all kinds of examples of people's fascination and the appeal of uh, putting intelligence into inanimate objects. Next. Ah, this is one of my favorites, just, just to, to throw this in. This is around uh, 1515. And this is a proposal that was made by Leonardo da Vinci as a gift uh, from the Pope to the King. 
and it was a mechanical lion. And again, it was it was as close as they could come to a robot in the era. He was using the very cutting edge technology of clock making, which was brand new at the time or relatively new and certainly would have been astonishing. Unfortunately, this was never built. It was too expensive. It wasn't time for the king's in, inauguration or birthday or whatever or celebration it was. But the idea and this is a recreation, by the way, from da Vinci's notes and um, whatever he left behind on this project. But the idea was that this enormous lion, which was like almost seven feet by 10 feet, was going to be designed to autonomously walk down the, the royal, you know, in, in this celebration down the aisle of this celebration to the king to present itself right? It would not have anyone pushing it. It would be under the under the gears and mechanism of whatever the clockmaker came up with. And then when it got to the king, there was a panel in its, in its chest that would open and there were automated lilies inside that would then bloom. It was an enormous project and it would have been very beautiful. Um, and it wasn't made, but it just shows a, a very recent example of what what was fascinating, what was high tech in 1515 was this thing that if you asked me for a word for it, I'd call it a robot. Um, okay, next. So now let's, let's fast forward from 400 BC in 1515 to uh, what we're really talking about, which is artificial intelligence uh, in the more modern sense. So I'm going to make a hyperbolic statement that Alan Turing started all the fuss. He's not the only one I'm going to say, and I have it as a last line here. I don't think you guys can see my pointer, but there's Norbert Wiener, who was doing a lot of work in uh, cybernetics at the time. People were thinking machines was the buzzword before artificial intelligence. And Claude Shannon, who was in information theory, which is a brand new field that he invented and was essential to the movement of research in this arena. McCullough and Pitts, on the other hand, were neuroscientists uh, back when we weren't quite sure of the structure of a neuron or how they, uh, how those cells interacted with each other. And Marvin Minsky, who many of you may have heard of, um, he, I think he just passed a few years ago and he was interested in the science of linguistics. And these all seem very separate, all essential for the development of artificial intelligence. But I'm going to put Alan Turing at the top of this pile because he originally asked the question, can machines think? He posed the question, and then he answered the question in a number of articles and papers um, that I'm going to say more about in a second. But you may recognize his name from a movie, The Imitation Game, which is interesting because that's his own phrase taken from one of his uh, papers. But basically, aside from his work at Bletchley Park and you know, with the code breaking, um, he was very interested in the nature of computation. And the interesting thing, the fascinating thing about this is that he was doing this in the early 1930s. In the early 1930s, there were barely computers. The Zeus, Zeus D3 is the first known computer, the first acknowledged computer in computer history, 1941. Okay, so this is his thesis in 1936, the uh, universal computing or Turing machine, which we still talk about which means he was discussing the philosophy of AI and how it would work without having any knowledge of how computers would eventually work or what they could do. So this was a purely um, a, a mathematical approach that he was taking. And he was he actually came up with his universal computer is it will work. Uh, the Turing machine is a, a model of how a computer would work and universal computing means that it can compute anything that's computable, anything modern, no matter the size. It might need infinite time, but that wasn't a question. The question wasn't, is this practical? Uh, like all good basic science questions, it wasn't about um, starting a new business. It was about answering the, the, the more, the deeper question if this is possible. Um, and it is, and it was, and the universal computing or Turing machine was a fantastic breakthrough and it really got the field started. Between that and his asking the question, uh, can machines think, which he codified all his thinking in a very important 1950s paper that is still cited and is still important in the field. And that, along with something I'm going to mention in the next slide, is the birth of artificial intelligence. Um, next slide, please. 
So I wanted to show a picture of Alan Turing, and more importantly to me at least, is a picture of him as a young man smiling. There's not a lot of pictures of him smiling. I think this is a great, um, captures a little bit of him as a human, as opposed to just this name and, of, you know, an ancient person. So that's a photo of Alan Turing, uh, probably at the beginning of graduate school. And this is a uh, just a picture of the first page of that important paper, uh, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And I'm going to read the first line because I think it's important. First of all, the title of the section is The Imitation Game, and that's his own words and his phrase to open this paper. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? I mean, really, it couldn't be more to the point of artificial intelligence. This paper, which I encourage anyone interested to look up and read, if you just put in the title, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, it'll pop up. It's it's that important. It'll be at the top of any search for that, for that name. Um, and what he did in this paper, what he developed is um, there's some number of arguments, maybe 15 different ways of considering how machines would or would not be able to think. And he worked out the debates in this paper, like each one gets a page or two. And he says why he thinks in each individual case, why he thinks that objection would not turn out to be true. And he uh, cites his references and he, in the paper, he specifically says, science is about discourse. These are my opinions. I understand that people will disagree. This is a this doesn't have an answer now. It's 1950, and it doesn't have a computer to run on. He didn't say that, but uh, you know, it's it definitely had to be on everybody's mind because they they knew it was a theoretical paper. And he said discourse and disagreement is what drives science forward. And I think that that's also very true and very important. In any case, the arguments in this paper are still cited. And all the examples he gave, he said, well, this will be true, or this is how this will work. They all they all came to pass. He, nothing that he predicted um, didn't happen. I mean, he, his, his extrapolations were correct and his thinking was very solid. His work was very clean. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, there was artificial intelligence, there was thinking machines. That was a big expression and people were always talking about it. So this is, um, and then even in the 1950s, well, not even in the 1950s, the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, people would think about and talk about thinking machines and were they possible and how would you build them? Uh, and they were basically dealing with the field of cybernetics and automata. And automata is like that lion. Automata would be a robot without any ability for artificial intelligence of any kind. It would be a robot that would be under mechanical control. So if you had a robot, a train or a a robot looking robot and you had a hand control and you made it walk around the room um people had toys like this for a long time that would be an, a, a type of automata they usually historically referred to things that you would wind up like clockwork um or even those toys that you wind the back and they kind of walk around that does that the word for that is an automata so obviously an automata embodied with the control of a computer that's thinking on its own would be very close to a modern day artificial intelligence so around between 1954 the end of 1954 and 1956 another important person in the history of ai john mccarthy at dartmouth college um, birth the term artificial intelligence and the real birth of the field is considered a very important summer workshop that he hosted he made, he originally wrote the proposal at the end of 1954 and it happened in 1956 it was a summer workshop it was eight weeks long and the history of it still persists all the groundwork for the field was laid at that time it was 10 or 11 people because it wasn't a big field and no one had heard of it and uh, so it was being put together by these turned out to be luminaries in the field. Um, so these 10 or 11 people included people I mentioned earlier, Marvin Minsky, uh, Claude Shannon. Uh, I'm actually not sure off the top of my head if Turing was at this meeting. I think he was, but I'm, I think he may not have been, but it doesn't matter. He knew about it and he was talking to the people that were there and his imprint and his contributions were certainly present at this meeting. Um, so let me look at my notes for a second. 
So the goal of the meeting was to not only address the questions of if computers could think, but how could we make this happen? They also talked a little bit about the nature of cognition, uh, but from then to now, the development of AI isn't really able to answer the question. Cognition and thinking are different. However, cognition and the contribution of psychologists was important to the field because for a long time until recently, there was a debate, and this is very important in the history of AI, between designing something that would act and think like a human or that would simply be able to use mathematical reason to solve a problem. And after many years of trying both, including in the 70s and 80s, things like expert systems um, and other, other designs that were that we're trying to mimic how, how humans sort of proceed through a problem. You know, you think of a problem and then you, you realize that you have to work it out and think of the consequences. And then you think of the implications, say you go down a sort of a decision tree, and then at the end you reach your action. That's sort of a map of how humans would approach a problem. That's not always how reason works, and, and modern AI doesn't work that way at all. So it was, in, in the field, those two things were sort of at odds. So it was important to consider cognition, especially at the beginning of the field. But as I said, the development of AI, AI doesn't fully answer how human cognition works or proceeds. Um, I think it's important to note that AI that we have now is the result of many decades at this point, right, since the mid 50s of incremental design improvements and engineering breakthroughs, which address many problems and more recent problems that have begun to be solved is things like um, AIs that can handle many different problems or programming questions, even though it's the same AI program, it can be a generalizer that's brand new and that's being done at, at uh, DeepMind at Google. Um, in dealing with incomplete knowledge, you don't know, right? No one, no agent knows all the information in their environment. It actually, bi biological intelligence, people, animals, we all have to deal with the problem of incomplete knowledge. Very difficult to deal with though with a computer. Computer program, you give it a step, a step, a step, it does the steps, it gives you some answer at the end, it comes to a conclusion and it halts. Um, so dealing with a problem that has incomplete knowledge and still moving forward was a real breakthrough. Uh, it was a real problem at early, uh, early designs of AI and is a real more recent breakthrough. And so the engineering breakthroughs continue to dealing with uncertainty in, in the data sets, in the, in the sensor data, in the environment, dealing with noise, which is different from uncertainty, dealing with error, which is different from noise, right? All these problems had to be um, taken, dealt with, not taken care of. And that's something that has happened as the field has developed. So from the 50s to now, an amazing amount of engineering research has been done. So I want to point out, I think this is really important to, to remember, um, the ability of a machine to think has not been reached. You're going to read things in the media. There's going to be stories about, there's a very famous robot called Sophia, for example. She's been, she's been in the news a lot. And she was granted uh, maybe two years ago uh, citizenship in another country, I think Saudi Arabia. And that makes you think, well, she's on, on her own or she's thinking on her own. This, this program is, you know, very close to human. And the company um, leans on that a little bit. But if you go to their website or you read a, a deeper interview, they'll say, yes, this is a program. It's a chatbot. It has uh, predetermined answers. We want to introduce people to the idea of AI and thinking robots. We want to prepare them for when this happens. Um, but Sophia is not there yet. If you don't look deeply, you will think that we are there because it's tricky and it's very compelling when you see this thing that looks like a human and acts like a human and talks like a human. You know, there's a joke about that, but with ducks, like then it's a, it's a human. So I'm specifically telling you this because it's important to know what the limits of AI are and they, the ability of a machine to think on its own has not been reached. So do not be fooled by misleading reports or brief reports that don't say everything. Um, something you may want to contemplate, and I will say more about neural networks, but you've probably heard the term. 
neural networks is one approach to AI that now in modern times has blown most other approaches out of the water. And it is the leading, um, the leading breakthroughs happen with advancements in neural networks. So neural networks are very important and I'm gonna mention them again. They, however, need millions and mil enormous data sets, of, um, millions of data points in order to learn something. Um, a child usually needs one. Right, you, you show the child a cat, like here's the cat, the kid's like, cat, I got the cat. Here's an owl, yeah, they might mix up a hawk with an owl, but they, they have the idea that it's a bird and very quickly they'll know what an owl is. Now I'm not saying everything kids learn, you know, reading takes more than one example or learning multiplication tables, but in general, um, a child learns with this thing called one-shot learning and AI is nowhere near that. Another example of how different it is from biological intelligence. I think really the best way to think of AI now is it's a statistical data searching tool. And I will say more about that in, in a couple of slides, but that's what it is. It sets boundaries, it um, organizes data, it pulls out patterns. It's a statistical data searching tool. That's all it is right now, no matter how advanced it gets and it can be very impressive, but it's a statistical data searching tool. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna step back in time a little bit to 1954, the proposal um, that was written in order to have the workshop, you have to propose it. So John McCarthy wrote a proposal and there's these excerpts that I like, and I think they give you a lot of flavor of, the, of, of AI. Uh, the question that they were answering is, can a computer learn like a child, which we just established they can't, but then he, he defines it a little more. Without programming, by collecting data via sensors, your eyes are sensors, your fingers are sensors. Well, there's biological, that's biological sensors. AIs have cameras and they have uh, pressure sensors. They have temperature sensors. They have um, microphones. They have tons of sensors, maybe even more than humans. So by collecting data via sensors, and then by putting that data together without direction or without much direction, using trial and error. So specifically, although the question, can a computer learn like a child, I would say not yet. Everything else is yes. Without programming, yes. By collecting, except for the neural network that's been set up by programming, but running it, it runs itself. By collecting data via sensors, yes. Putting it together without much direction, yes. Using trial and error, yes. And then here's a quote, another one, machines that have the ability, he's saying what an AI will be. Machines that have the ability to use language develop formal reasoning, form abstractions, that's amazing, and concepts, solve problems, and improve. That's a great definition of AI. Written in 54, there weren't, what computer was around in 54? There was ENIAC, came out in 48. So it was doing, I mean, it's tubes, right? That was barely even a programmable computer, although it was much faster than earlier computers like Colossus, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, those were electromechanical computers. But in any case, they were compared to what we have today, it was like uh, bearskins and toothpicks, to quote Spock uh, from Star Trek. So it was it was this very clumsy, clunky machine, and they were that's all they had, and they were still asking these very pointed questions that again guided the field to where we are today. Next slide. So to get back to the title of my talk, what is AI? I'm going to give you some, some answers that you can find by poking around the web. It turns out that there's not a single definition or answer, and people over the years have given many answers to this simple question, and here are some of the ones that I like. But you'll see if you put them all together, and especially with what I've said so far, you're going to come to some uh, consensus that there, there's a similarity, a strong similarity between all of them. AI is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially computer programs, McCarthy. AI uses a variety of methods to extract useful patterns from data. My favorite phrase, if you get nothing else out of this talk, just remember, useful patterns from data, useful patterns from data. That's what AI is doing, useful patterns from data. It should be a song or a t-shirt. Using automated techniques and as little human intervention as possible, beautiful. Um, AI uses computer-based tools that are able to systematize and automate tasks autonomously. It's not enough that it's systematizing them and automating them. It's also doing it on its own. 
and adapting. If something goes wrong with the task that's automated, it runs out of one of the ingredients or something falls off the, the belt or some disruption happens, the AI can accommodate for it. It can either stop, which is a very simple accommodation, or work around it, which is a more human, uh, and certainly if you're running the company, a, a better approach to work around it, to solve a problem and not just robotically stop. That's the goal of AI. Next. Here's a couple more answers, and he's, these have attributes. It's the study and design of intelligent agents, a system that perceives its environment, takes actions, and maximizes its chances of success. You can take an action, right? You can take any kind of action. I can pick up my coffee cup and pour it on my head, but since I intend to drink it and I don't like being wet, um, you know, that's not a good action to take. If an AI, well, an AI is not going to drink coffee, but if an AI is doing something, you know, it doesn't only want to pick up the block, it wants to build something or move it to an appropriate place. So the actions that it makes have to maximize its chance of success at its task. Um, so that's Russell and Norvig from 2010. And that's from this, I'm showing this textbook. This is actually the last edition. There's a newer edition, but this is a great book. And this course is online, I believe at Coursera, and I believe it's free. And it is a fantastic course, Artificial Intelligence, uh, Russell and Norvig. So if you're interested, um, definitely look this up. Uh, it's, it's really uh, a life-changing course if this is something you're interested in. Another definition, a branch of computer science that allows computers to make predictions and decisions to solve problems. So we keep coming back to the same core idea. This is a, a website called AI for All, very a year old, is not even, I don't know when they wrote this in 2020, but it's probably about a year old. At, or the design of an autonomous computer system that can take in data, store it, remember and manipulate it, learn from it, and then choose autonomously an action, develop a solution, or solve a specified problem with no direction. And that's my definition from three days ago when I was preparing this talk. It's as good as any. And um, I think that if you put these all together, you've got a great idea of what AI is. Next slide, please. So one of the things that came up at this conference in the 50s, before people knew where the field was going or anything, I can't stress that enough, because I think it was very difficult to put these together correctly. And yet from then to now, with all the innovations that are happening, have happened, these are still the same six areas that are essential to have AI. The, um, the AI system needs to be able to communicate to you. And that means uh, that started the development of natural language processing or NLP, which is a big field. And one example of that, um, it's older, is called NEL, Never Ending Language Learner, running at Carnegie Mellon University. You can just go online and check out what they're doing. It's very interesting. It is older technology. It's creating this enormous database of um, self-learned concepts by reading the web. This program, which has been running since 2010, is teaching itself language, never-ending language learner. Knowledge representation is a way you've got these sensors, right? You're say your optic nerves or your fingertips or your nose, whatever. It's a sensor and it's taking in data. Well, that data needs to be stored. You don't just take in data because what do you can do with it? If you take it in and it runs out, it's, you're not doing anything. You have to be able to, to represent that knowledge and uh, that means store it, organize it, be, be able to retrieve it, or you can have it organized but locked away or you can't get it. So organization is one thing, retrieving is another. Um, store it for long or short term, long or short term memory in case you guys have heard that term. Um, and uh, you need to have a platform to do all this. So that's uh, knowledge representation. So now you've got two fields, the third one. Automatic reasoning, just because you have the knowledge doesn't mean you have any conclusions you've drawn from it. Now you have to use that knowledge and feed it into some computer program or some technology that can use it to do reason. You have to answer questions, you have to draw conclusions, you have to navigate in an environment, you have to reach a goal that all must be reached by um, some kind of reasoning that's happening on, on a computer artificially, not by a human. Machine learning, which is related to automatic reasoning, but it's different, is um, that the machine can learn from the data and also adapt 
uh, detect anomalies and extrapolate or innovate, right? That's different from just reasoning. You can reason one and two is uh, <laughs> three, but you can't, maybe you should, it's a different skill to be able maybe uh, three and four is a different number. So that's an extrapolation or a derivation. So that would be more, not so much um, automatic reasoning, but machine learning. Computer vision is using sensors to interpret um, images and visual data, and then the development of computer hardware. So you need you have to run all this stuff, right? We're just talking about it, but you have to actually do it on something. And for a long time, not having the hardware was a severe limitation in the field of AI in the 70s. For example, things were very slow and then research funding ended and was uh, it's called an AI winter when there was not a lot of interest and there was not a lot of funding for AI. And it was because people weren't progressing. They had ideas like these ideas, like the meetings in the 50s were coming up with ideas. They didn't have the hardware to do it. So you need to have capable chip designs. You need to be able to run as you increase the AI programs faster. Uh, the chip needs to be faster. It needs to get rid of the heat. It's um, making by running faster. So it has to run cooler and needs to be smaller because you need more of them. So unless you want a computer the size of a, of a warehouse, like the early computers actually were, as you grow in complexity, as your programs grow in demanding power and space, the hardware needs to get smaller. Um, and then robotic designs need to have some, some mobile body to put all these skills if you want a mobile agent. With a mobile agent, you become able to deliver things, in, um, navigate in an environment. Uh, for example, delivery robots that we have now are mobile agents. And that's important if you want any kind of um, real world abilities to come out of these AIs. So next slide, please. So what's necessary to reach these six goals? And that's that's pretty obvious, right? You need to design computer hardware. So that's what people are doing between the 50s and now. And we have Moore's Law showing us that people are very busily progressing in this. You need cross-disciplinary knowledge, which is something I alluded to earlier when I was talking about cybernetics and linguistics. But the field of AI is highly cross-disciplinary. Um, there's a, still a lot of contributions from, neuro, from neuroscience and from cognition field, psychology and linguistics. And those are not computer science fields. Uh, so this is a highly cross-disciplinary field. There's a lot of ways that you can get into AI. Some are academic and some are work for Google, which, you know, they're very different. Um, because of the way AI developed now, uh, they didn't know this in the past, you need enormous amounts of data to train these neural networks. Again, I'll say more about that in a couple of slides. So it's very necessary to collect that data. It's not easy to get um, 10 million pictures of a cat and then 10 million pictures of the dog so that you can get an AI to learn the difference between a cat and a dog. Um, you know, 100 is okay that I could get that in a while, but when you go up to the amounts of data that you need gigabytes, it's not easy to collect that kind of data. And then you need human innovation, uh, which will utilize tools of mathematics. Uh, linear algebra is highly used in uh, AI development and basic basic research in AI. Statistics, probabilities, those fields are the top, the top ones that you'll need. Um, and then, like I said several times, cognitive science, neuroscience, you need engineers and both computer engineering and robotic engineering and the development of hardware and software. So those are necessary things that we've had over the past 50 years to move the field forward. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, thank you. I'd like to skip this. This is just to show, to remind people of Moore's Law. This is a logarithmic scale. So this may look linear until you look closer. This is an exponential growth of, um, of, the, of the, the speed and the complexity of, of hardware um, that is available to, to, to computer and engineers. And this slide, I won't discuss all the bits of it, but there's a line in the middle that says that this increase is at least half the reason for AI's recent progress. That's uh, something to really consider. If we didn't have the hardware, we wouldn't be able to have the software. This, the, the progress 
in, um, in keeping the hardware, increasing it in complexity and capability is essential to the development of AI. And that led to, as I alluded already, there were two massive AI winters that really held the field back about seven years apiece. Uh, one was, I think, in the 60s and one was in the late 70s, something like that. But on the other hand, there was nothing much that probably could have been done in that era because people didn't have the hardware. Next slide. We'll skip this mostly, but I just want to say this is, again, those six arenas, machine learning, natural language processing, speech, vision, robotics, expert systems, um, knowledge representation is, is, they called it planning, scheduling, and optimization, but it's basically um, a, a graphic of those six areas and things that they led to, but they all feed into the development of artificial intelligence, and they're all necessary. Next slide. This is saying the same thing again, so next slide. I just wanted to give a flavor of actually this book, which clearly is a very uh, important book in, in my opinion, Norvig and Russell. Um, this is the overall textbook sessions. And part of the reason I'm saying it is because obviously can't cover everything, but this is a thick book. And I'd say it would take a full uh, two semesters to go through. And so it has a lot of sections. These are not chapters, these are sections. Each one of these has 15 chapters or something in it. But there's problem solving, which is a lot of uh, different ways to solve problems, uh, like uh, tree searching and um, different kinds of, of, of searches that people can do, computer searching that are not machine learning and not neural networks. And then there's um, a whole section on how to do, how to store knowledge and do reasoning on it, automatic reasoning and planning, and how to deal with uncertain knowledge and reasoning, which is the beginning. You'll see it's well past the half of the book. That's the beginning of the introduction of probabilities and statistics and Bayesian probabilities. You may hear that term uh, and it's important. And then learning is where machine learning is introduced. So when people say artificial intelligence nowadays, they're mostly talking about neural networks, which I said earlier, but the development of the field, there's a lot of different tools, none of them scaled well. I mean, there are bits and pieces that have persisted, but in general, the the biggest um, escalation in capability has happened with the uh, development of neural networks. They solve a lot of problems very quickly, very well, and autonomously. And then communicating, perceiving, and acting is, is speech, um, vision, and motion. So that just gives you flavor of the field. Next slide. This is a quick um, graphic. We're not going to discuss it too much. Um, it's actually from a, a talk that was given at Google, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the speaker's name, but I will put it in the comments. I'm going to look it up because he should get credit for his slides. And what it does show, though, is the first time, and the next slide will be better, these dots right in the middle, this is a graphic of a neural network, and these circles are nodes, and the lines connecting them are important. Uh, they're uh, edges in, in a graph, and they have a number associated with them, and that's a weight. And so, although this looks like a very uh, appealing, but maybe puzzling picture, in a, in a very real way, what it is, is a graphical representation of a single linear algebraic equation. It's, it's matrix algebra. And so if you've ever seen a matrix algebra equation, which can be written on one line, that's what a neural network is. So it may look imposing and alien and arty and cool, but it's linear algebra. So if you're, if you're wondering what AI is, that's another answer, it's linear algebra. Um, and the neural networks are based in linear algebra. So next slide, please. So this is a better slide in, in my opinion. First of all, if you see very small, this says asimovinstitute.org under the word networks, a mostly complete chart of neural networks. And this chart is called, I believe, the zoo of neural networks. So if you Google that, you should find this chart. And the reason I think that's a valuable exercise is because this is actually page one of a multi-page document. And each one of these networks, which I'll say a couple of words about in a second, but you'll see the first one is Perceptron or Feed Forward. Each one of these will have a, a half a page to a page devoted to it. 
and it will have references on how it was developed, uh, the initial papers or review articles on each one of these. They're all important in the history of the development of neural networks. Perceptron was actually around as early as the 60s, and uh, basically it's two inputs and you, you could almost add them, right, and get an output. It's a very simple idea. And in the early days, people were studying them as a very simple model of what they thought a neuron was. And they would hook a lot of these together and it would sort of act like a bunch of switches. And you would think in the 60s, like, oh, well, how, am I, how far can this go? Well, it turns out that it could go really far. In fact, it could go to where DeepMind is going today. And we have one program playing 57 Atari games all by itself without any instruction. That's how far it can go. So it's always a good idea to start with something simple and keep on studying it and working. Um, I recommend this, this zoo of uh, neural networks to anyone who's interested, but basically this is just a, I just wanted to show what a neural network looked like. And these are all linear algebra equations. They all represent or model a, a certain linear algebra equation. Next slide, please. So these are just words so that if you see them in, in the literature, you know, you'll know you you'll know that a little bit about what they're referring to. They're all types of neural networks. The perceptron I just mentioned, multi-layer perceptron, feed-forward neural network, old-fashioned, but people still talk about it. And then the, the modern ones, much more modern, like 2006 was a real true uh, deeper dive into convolutional neural networks, deep learning, um, recurrent neural networks, these are just different kinds of equations, adversarial uh, neural networks and uh, generative adversarial neural networks or GANs, which you will hear a lot about if you start looking on, on the internet. Next, please. This is not as complete as I would like. And some I've mentioned earlier and, and some I didn't, but like rationality using reason, cognitive science feeds into it, knowledge representation. So there's, and there's more of these, you know, you could make a lot more ovals and fill in more, but it gives you an idea of how hierarchical and layered artificial intelligence is. It's not just math. It's not just linear algebraic equations. It's the combination and the, um, the, uh, reinforcement uh, uh, and symbiosis, that's the better word, of all these fields coming together to inform and enhance the strengths of artificial intelligence as it develops, because it's still definitely a brand new field that's growing very rapidly and advances are happening every six months and maybe even more often. Uh, it's a very rapidly growing field. Next, please. So this slide can be boring as can the next, but you can also pause and just read them. So I'll just say a few things from them. The sum ignition, uh, understanding the environment. There's a, an app on Google somewhere that if you show it a snapshot of a view out the window, it will tell you where that picture was taken. And while it's obvious that if someone sends you a snapshot of the Eiffel Tower, it's like Paris probably. Uh, I mean, a side street without any data on it, without a street sign, um, it can tell you uh, definitely the city and it can be some small town, but it could maybe even tell you depending on the data, um, the, the location. So environmental recognition is something that people don't think about a lot, but it's, it's, very, uh, it's very well developed. Um, it can listen to speech and recognize words and concepts and sentiments. It can, it can tra transfer text to speech or speech to text. Um, expert guidance, medical diagnoses, flight control, um, automatic driving, you know, like the Teslas, uh, forecasting weather, which, you know, maybe that doesn't seem so impressive, but there's something now called now casting, which I think is just a few months old and it is telling you the weather for the next few hours, which may not be that impressive in the middle of a normal day. You look outside and you tell yourself the weather for the next few hours, it's sunny and it will probably be sunny in a few hours. But what now casting can do and has been successful uh, in limited experimentation because it's brand new is saying, oh, it looks nice now, 
but in a snap storm is coming. If you're hiking in the uh, Grand Canyon, you might want to be aware that there's going to be a flash flood. It save your life. Or there's this uh, tornado coming in in 40 minutes, and there's there's no uh, you can't tell what direction it's going to go. But we're telling you it's going to go through your town because we're doing this now casting. So it's very fine control on things that can happen very suddenly with the weather, and that when it's developed definitely will save lives. Um, digital personal assistance. My new phone has this assistant that wants to do everything for me. I don't know that I like it yet, but it's definitely useful and tons of people that can like it. I can see that it would be very compelling. It'll tell you what you're going to do in an hour and what appointments you have and put the music that you like on and remind you to take an aspirin or go for a walk or do some exercises. I mean, a personal assistant is, can be a very useful thing. Um, AI makes social recommendations. Do you want to friend this person? Do you is this a family member? Do you this person has an interest that she has shared with yours? Maybe you want to, you know, check out their page. And the social recommendations happen all the time. We've become very used to them. Where do they come from? They come from AI. Video suggestions. You go on Netflix, you've watched this. Maybe you'd like to see this next. Or let's pick something for you because you don't want to surf around for two hours and not see anything. We're going to say what we think you'll like. That could be a useful thing. Targeted ads. Everybody loves ads, right? <laughs> so if you're looking for, uh, I don't know, a brick of cheese or um, a wheel for your tractor and AI overhears you talking about it, whether we like it or not, that's what happens. And all of a sudden you get ads for tractor wheels instead of spending an hour looking for a tractor wheel. It may listen to other things too. So people should be aware that it doesn't just listen for things you wanna buy but that's a different talk. Uh, meanwhile, these are things that AI can do and does do. We know they can play games. Um, AlphaGo, which has, is better than any human grandmaster at Go. And then it's been advanced since it won against Lee Sedol in I think 2016, which was a massive upset in the field. And the interesting thing about it is that um, the Lee was interviewed afterwards and he said it was not like playing any human player, that AI made moves that humans would never ever make. Um, and to a lot of researchers in the field, what that meant was that the AI was innovating. It was, it had not learned by watching humans, although some AIs are doing that now. It had taught itself to play and it had found, um, uh, gambits and plays that had never been uh, discovered, not discovered, uh, explored by humans playing the game in all the years of Go. Nobody was using these moves. The Lee said it was like playing against an octopus or something. I don't think that's a quote, but he, he said it was like playing against a foreign mind um, and that that was uh, a very uh, different feeling for him. Like he definitely felt it in his gut. And that's very interesting because it was innovating. It was innovating and that's something that Turing would have loved to hear about as well as McCarthy. Uh, so the engine behind AlphaGo was something that Google calls GPT-4 and that's a, a, a generalized learning algorithm. Um, and it can also, AI can chat with you. It can have a conversation I don't think chatbots, in my opinion, you can look for them online yourself. I don't think they match the capabilities of, um, of, of playing Go, for example. I don't think they fool anybody. After two or three sentences, you're very sure that you're talking to uh, something that's not human. Um, but there are different technology, and there's actually a typo here. Chatbots are run, Google's chatbots, which are very good, are run by GPT-3. Uh, and that's just a different program. So those are some things AI can do. Uh, don't get scared, but the next slide is coming. Next slide. <laughs> oh my God, so many words. So um, I am not going to read through these. I think I did enough on the last slide, but if you're interested, you pause the talk and just read through these. This is some applications, known applications of neural networks. So clearly AI is solving a lot of different problems. There's a huge difference between a prediction on the stock, which is a time series prediction, predicting in, in data that goes through time and then seeing where it's gonna go, and facial recognition, which is um, understanding or identifying something in a, in a flat picture that has no temporal dependence. It can do both those things and all these other things instead. I mean, in addition, it can do, different AIs, of course, can do these different tasks and they're 
widely used. They're what people don't even really, I think, realize how much AI has penetrated um, our society or the our world. The next slide, please. So it's important to remember that the usage of AI can be tricky, all right? It's not perfect and uh, it's programmed. It's a linear algebra equation, as we said earlier, finding patterns in data. Um, and you have to understand the limitations of the AI and the data that's being used as well. You must ask the correct question and you must have good data. These are subtle uh, con concepts that may be difficult to assess, assess. So let me give an example that I think is, is a good one. There's a, there's a database that helps people identify handwritten numbers. This was uh, it's called MNIST and it was commissioned by the post office maybe 15 or 20 years ago. And the MNIST um, program, which is very successful, scans in uh, handwritten numbers and it says what the number is. So that instead of the post office having, you know, people read the letters and this is a typo here or this is something I can't read, this thing reads the numbers and then it sorts the letters out and the postman can deliver them. It saves a lot of time. As the volume of mail goes up, it makes the it makes delivery happen quicker. Okay, so this MNIST program runs and it runs on envelopes. So what do people write on envelopes? They write addresses. They don't write squiggles. So what happens with MNIST though, which is not expecting squiggles, is you can go to the data program and naively say, I wonder what it will think this is and draw some kind of squiggle. And the program will look at the squiggle and say seven or two. Right? Because the program, you're not asking the correct question of that program. All of its trading data is on numbers. It has a huge data set that went in, but they're all numbers. There's no squiggles in there. And then the way the program's written, the only answer it can give you is between zero and nine, because those are numbers. It doesn't have an infinite number of squiggles to would not allow it to answer that question anyway. So you have to ask the correct question, you have to know the limitations of your data set and it has to be clean, or you're gonna get not garbage in, garbage out. And sometimes that can happen by accident, sometimes it can happen on purpose, and sometimes there's a bug in the program. Another thing is that AI algorithms are generally highly parameterized, think of it as tweaking. The, the, if you remember those pictures of neural networks, right? Uh, if you're making adjustments or multiplying by, by constants throughout the equation, say, there's a lot of different parameters that can be changed and altered and adjusted. In fact, some of that happens automatically and that's part of what, how AI works is that it adjusts those edges or weights by itself. Um, However, there's a series of things that are called hyperparameters and they're like, you can put a bias in, you can put constants in, you can um, set cutoffs for your data. Those are set by the researcher. And if you're using maybe empirical data to match to your um, output, it's some shape that a molecule can never take, you can parameterize it to not go there, not explore that part of the potential energy service. Um, so that's okay to control your output, but you have to be careful how you're controlling the output. And an error could give you an answer that, well, it ran through the AI, AI you know, this is correct. No, it's not because it was an error that you didn't know about. It could also be purposeful. I want people to think the answer is this, so ha ha ha, I'm going to parameterize this in a certain way that it, it comes and it supports that I should get a raise or something. Um, so you have to be careful that and know that there are a lot of parameters and that there can be a bias in the information. An AI system can be made to find anything, any can give any answer at all. It's just an equation. If it's given skewed data, or misparameterize, and that can happen due to a bug in the program, um, malicious programmer, or uh, innocent error. And uh, even though you to come to the right conclusion for whatever reason. So you have to be very careful. And in fact, just this week, 
some professor, mm, I wish I could remember the university, again, I'll put it in the notes, they just won um, a prize, a million dollar prize uh, in mathematics, uh, put out by a company, but a prize is a prize. And the, the area of this person's research was um, making AI uh, more um, accountable. So that when, some, when an AI reached a conclusion, it would be able to say what the parameters were and how it got to that conclusion. And that is a huge advance in the ethics of AI. I just read about this today, which is why I don't really remember the person's name, but it's a, it's a, a huge breakthrough because we have AIs that, for example, hand out prison sentences, right? Or you're gonna have this fine and you're gonna go to jail for this long and they're proprietary and that's not right. Um, if someone is going to go uh, serve a sentence we should be able to say what was weighed, what information and in what they did was weighed as enough to give them this sentence. And that way the prisoner can also learn what they did wrong and we can be sure that the judgment is fair. So I think this is an enormous breakthrough and I was very happy to read about that today. It will cut down on um, misleading parameters and bugs in programs, accidentally poor data or mis mi intentional misprogramming. Next slide, please. So this is some examples, and we're getting close to the end, uh, of instructive, unexpected AI results that are well known and um, in the history of AI. So the MNEST data set identifying a squiggle as a certain number is well known. Um, a few years ago, I think again around 2015, 2016, Microsoft put out a chatbot named Tay. It was supposed to be a teenage girl. Uh, and within 16 hours, <laughs> Tay became rude and discriminatory. Um, so I think that that's kind of amazing that it happened so fast. But of course, that was a programming error. And I definitely think that was an error. There was nobody would do that on purpose. Um, but the, the errors that chatbots listen to when you talk to them and they take in your uh, comments as things that it can use in its corpus of expressions to use in responding back. So what the programmers didn't foresee, I don't know why, is that with a worldwide release of Tay, they didn't expect that people would tease it or, you know, they know it's an AI and not a person. So they could say really mean things or really rude things. And Tay was putting these expressions into her uh, or its corpus of responses and then responding back to people, you know, these very horrible things. So it was pulled down and uh, was not was not released, re-released yet but uh, it was unexpected and it's instructive because now people know why they didn't know then I couldn't tell you to watch out for a chatbot taking in all the expressions that are said to it. You might want to judge which expressions you want your chatbot to repeat. Um, there's a famous uh, example, I guess, of Google had a facial recognition program and it immediately, like within a week of release, people were noticing that it was not able kidding and they pulled it they pulled it off and they took a long time correcting it I think because they wanted to do it right but it's proprietary and I don't know the programming I don't know how that happened and I don't know how they fixed it um but they did fix it and they did re-release it and people are very happy with it now uh but that that's a huge unexpected and instructive result it, that was clearly uh, an error um, as well as the next one, right? A Tesla car is all these auto driving cars. And of course there's gonna be accidents, sad but true. And they're all very sad to hear about. Um, and this one to me is one of the saddest, but there was a Tesla car being tested and there's, there's humans in them. They're supposed to override any errors, but uh, what's happening is that after 80, you know, 120, 300 hours behind the wheel of this thing self-driving perfectly, um, people's attention drifts. They go to sleep or they start using their phone and you can't force people to watch the road. And it's extremely boring to sit there and watch the car driving perfectly for dozens of hours. So in this particular case, Actually, I don't know if a, an attentive driver could have stopped it because my understanding is it happened very fast, but it identified an exit ramp um, on the road and of course automatically got off at that exit ramp, but it was a brick wall. 
I don't know the details of why a brick wall was in the location of an exit ramp. I don't know if the car got the location wrong or if there was a, some kind of construction that day. I've never heard of a brick wall being built across an exit ramp. Um, so I don't have all the details, but this was a fatal accident. It was in the national news, at least, if not international news. And it was acknowledged by Tesla as an error that it did the car did self-drive into a brick wall. So that is clearly uh, an unexpected AI result. Again, that software is proprietary. I can only assume it was instructive. I'm, I'm really 99.999999% sure it was instructive. It was definitely unexpected. Um, whatever, it, whatever glitch was there was, I can't say for sure that it was fixed, but I'm sure they worked on it um, or disabled it. So the Atari... Uh, the multi-game player, the GPT-4 that I mentioned earlier, actually breaks game rules to increase its score. It's given a goal of getting a high score. And somewhere along the way, it learns that bashing into a wall gets you a certain number of points of bashing in and spinning, I think. So instead of finishing the maze or finishing the game, I don't know, Atari, but it was some kind of game of a ship going through a lane. It started just bashing the ships around and breaking everything, but getting a high score because they didn't additionally give a goal, not only getting a high score, but also completing the game. It just knew about getting a high score. So it did exactly what you'd expect. It maximized its score. It, it doesn't, it's not human. It doesn't know about finishing the game. It knows about maximizing the score. Um, this was actually really in the news quite a bit. There was a Facebook chatbot that created its own language. And it was the language it created sounded really creepy, like it was uh, to me, to me, to me, to me, ball, ball. No, I don't No, I don't No, I don't. It was like very repetitive. And when you played it through a speaker, it sounded very creepy. But it turns out the programmers understood this. This was much more minor than it was made out to be in the news. It was not turning against humans or coming sentient. Um, it was simply using the language in a more efficient way to negotiate an exchange. And the reason that the, pro the project was shut down, unlike what you'll read in the paper, whereas they were afraid of it, they were not afraid of it. It's supposed to be a chatbot that interacts with the public. The public is not going to want to talk with something saying weird stuff like to me, to me, to me, to me. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. It, repeating it. it. The public wants to have a normal conversation. So they reprogrammed it. They said, you have to follow the rules of English. and of course, now it doesn't do those things. Um, but that was an instructive, unexpected AI result. Next slide, please. So these are a bunch of clips that I'm going to uh, recommend that anyone uh, who's watching this far, these are very interesting um, examples that I've, I've sort of handpicked. Of course, you can find more once you get started with these. The first one I love is a, a lab at the, in Zurich that has uh, quadcopters, there's a little helicopter toys, this big or something, and how they communicate through a mesh network and do all sorts of ballistic things. They throw a ball back and forth and they throw a stick back and forth, balancing it um, on, its, on its end. And in order to be clear on how difficult that is, I didn't, I see I didn't label it, one of these videos, one of these links is to someone teaching you, a human, how to balance um, a stick like actually on the palm of your hands. You have to kind of move it, a very dynamic thing. You have to move it around. When you see how hard that is, the, the helicopters doing it by tossing it around is even more impressive. That is a fantastic piece of, of work. And then there's examples of DeepMind and the Boston Dynamics robots and some chatbots. And so this is my last slide. I wanna thank you for your attention. I hope that this was helpful in giving people some background on what AI is. And if you have any questions, please,